I'm Madan Rehani, President International Organization of Medical Physics. Today is the last day of the International Medical Physics Week. Thanks for your participation. I will introduce the moderator and then mod the moderator will continue with the rest of the program today. Today's moderator is Professor Eva Bezak. She is professor in medical radiation at the University of South Australia. She has been previously the chief physicist in Royal Host University Hospital in Adelaide. She has many academic achievements. She is currently the secretary general of IOMP and is elected as vice president and president elect of IOMP. With these few words, I will pass on to Professor Eva Bezek to continue the proceedings of the today. Eva, over to you. Thank you so much, Madame, and a good evening, good day, good morning, everyone. It is my greatest pleasure to invite our last presenter in this wonderful celebrations of the International uh, Medical Physics Week, uh, who is Professor Juliana Tomadasu, who will be talking about a very important topic of relative biological effectiveness of protons. And is it time for a change? Professor Tomadasa is professor in medical radiation physics and the head of the medical radiation physics division at the Department of Physics, Stockholm University. And she's also affiliated at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Also, she's our wonderful editor in chief of Physica Medica, which is not only European Journal of Medical Physics, but also an official one of the official journals of IOMP. Juliana is very well known for her work in radiation oncology and especially radiation biology. And with the rapid increase of proton therapy facilities around the world, radiation biology of protons is really an important question to be understood and answered. Over to you, Juliana. It's our pleasure to have you. Juliana, can you share the screen? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here during this last day of, of this absolutely special event and uh, talk about um, the relative biological effectiveness of uh, protons and the way um, it might impact in the future current clinical practice in uh, proton radiotherapy. So, as you know well, radiotherapy is one of the major forms of treatments for cancer. About half of the patients receiving radiotherapy in one form or another, alone or in conjunction to surgery and chemotherapy as, uh, as part of their treatment. The most frequent form of um, external beam radiotherapy involves photons, but protons and heavier ions than protons are also used. In Sweden, there is a long tradition in uh, proton therapy, in addition to photon therapy, that started a rather long time ago um, at uh, one of the first proton centers around the world um, operating in, in Uppsala. The old uh, proton uh, facility was replaced in 2015 by um, the National Proton Clinic called uh, the Scandion Clinic, that treated about 1,600 patients up to, to now. And opening new proton centers, it's a general trend around the world. The number of proton clinics, it's in continuous increase at an unprecedented rate. So it is expected that a much larger number of, of patients might benefit from proton therapy in the near future. And consequently, there are several questions that will arise, um, such as um, how should the patients be selected for proton treatments and not for uh, photon treatment? How should they be planned? How should they be evaluated? So one might think that the first question and uh, the subsequent two questions, but primarily the first one, on the patient selection for proton therapy 
should be answered by the radiation oncologist with rather minimal input from the medical physicist. This might not necessarily be true, as the input from uh, the physicist is needed if the selection is based on a comparison between photon and proton plants. So in many cases, the selection of the patients, it's done by making two plants, a photon and a proton plant for the same patient, and evaluating the potential gain the proton plant might bring in comparison to the photon one. In the planning process and in the evaluation process, the relative biological effectiveness of protons is taken into account in addition to the distribution of the dose, of the absorbed dose. So what is the relative biological effectiveness of uh, protons? In general, in order to quantify the difference in cell survival uh, or in biological effect of different radiation types, in the relative biological effectiveness was uh, defined by the um, uh, International Commission on Radiation Units and Measurements in the ICRU report number 30 from um, 79, if I'm not mistaken. And it was defined as the ratio of the absorbed dose of a reference radiation, usually photons, to the absorbed dose of a test radiation to produce the same level of biological effect, all the other conditions being the same. For many ions heavier than photons, uh, than protons, sorry, including carbon ions, the variation of RBE with the linear energy transfer of the particle as well as the tissue type, it's taken into account at the stage of treatment planning by employing special regular biological models for calculating the RBE weighted dose and hence for differential accounting for the effect of the physical dose depending on LAT and tissue type. In contrast, for protons, a constant value of 1.1 for the RBE is currently used, assuming thus that the absorbed dose of photons is 10% more efficient than the photon dose in creating any biological effect, regardless the LAT and the tissue type. So where does this uh, value come from? Well, it comes from the International Commission on Radiation Units and Measurements, more specifically, the ICRU report number um, 78 from 2007, that says that um, the available data on in vitro and in vivo systems, including uh, acute and late reacting tissues, are consistent with a tissue independent mean RB value of 1.1. Well, this is a rather clear and strong statement, and therefore the RB of 1.1 has been adopted um, by most uh, clinical centers following this uh, ICRU recommendations. There are, however, even in the ICRU 78 report indications that um, the RB of protons might not be equal to 1.1, as this ICRU 78 report shows, gives uh, experimental data showing increased RB in the distal part of the proton range leading therefore to the so-called biological rain shift behind the Bragg peak as a result of weighting absorbed dose by the RBE. And indeed, there is rather abundant experimental evidence in the literature pointing towards the fact that the RBE for in vitro cell survival, it's not constant for different types of cells, as well as for other endpoints than cell survival, as shown here in, in just few examples of studies that led further to the development of some early models for the variable proton RBE. We tried for a long time to understand uh, um, this, this processes and on modeling the proton RBE for various tumors and normal tissues as function of the energy of the particles and the tissue type whether being a normal tissue or a tumoral uh, tissue. And in parallel, there were irradiation experiments of cells of different types exposed to radiation in experimental setups that would resemble the ones for, for patients that were conducted at the Scandion Clinic as a, 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 to, to help guiding these this models, this understanding. Thus, cells in these experiments were uh, exposed to radiation in experimental setups, uh, as I said, that, that um, uh, resemble uh, the ones for patients. Um, and um, 
stars were irradiated, therefore, at different depths in the plateau region, resembling the irradiation of the normal tissue in front of the tumor or beyond the Bragg peak to simulate the irradiation of the normal tissue behind the distal edge of the target. And the results pointed out, as expected, to the fact that the relative biological effectiveness of protons is different uh, of the constant 1.1 value that is currently used in the clinic when planning the treatment of uh, the patients. So there is increasing evidence for the fact that uh, the RB of protons, it's not actually 1.1, but it varies with the endpoint, with the dose per fraction, the LAT, and of course the tissue type, as shown by several mathematical models based on in vitro cell survival data. And the relevance of, um, of the in vitro data for the clinical treatment planning could be questioned. But there is also clinical evidence that appears to be collecting as well. So a few years ago, uh, the Medical Physics Web has advertised a paper by uh, the MD Anderson group as the first clinical evidence of the variable proton RBE. And since then, there were several papers uh, along the same line. In this first paper, pediatric ependymoma patients who received proton therapy were analyzed to determine if areas of normal tissue damage indicated by post-treatment um, image changes were associated with increased biological effect of effectiveness of the dose the conclusions being that radiological changes on MR images after proton therapy were indeed correlated with increased LAT and potentially increased RBE. So the paradigm of a constant 1.1 proton RBE has started to be questioned. So how does the RBE vary? Well, there are several models for the variation of uh, RBE with LAT and the type of tissue expressed as the ratio of uh, the alpha and the beta parameters in the linear quadratic, the LQ model uh, for radiation-induced cell killing. And they share the basic approach that is presented in this, in this slide. So basically, by equating the effect of uh, photons and protons in, cell, in terms of, uh, of cell survival, and by assuming that the cell survival parameters, alpha and beta for protons, could be derived from the photon alpha and beta accounting for LAT through an um, LAT modifying factor um, called uh, LMF here, one could obtain an expression for the RB that could be fitted to cell survival experimental data in order to determine its parameters for some assumptions regarding the maximum and the minimum RBE. All the models have the similar features that are summarized in this equation. The RB for protons could be expressed as a function of the dose per fraction and uh, the parameters giving the response to uh, the photon dose, alpha and beta in the LQ formulas, which are modulated with modifying factors depending on, uh, on the LAT. The overall dependence on, of the RB on uh, the type of um, tissue described by the alpha over beta ratio and the proton dose per fraction for a given LAT it's shown in this 3D graph here. So one can see that the relative deviation of the RB from the constant 1.1 uh, value, that is on the vertical axis, is the largest for low alpha over beta tissues irradiated with a low dose per fraction. So if we take a look now, a closer look at um, RB values for some typical tissues and some LAT values as function of the proton dose per fraction, as predicted by three models that were proposed for the variable RBE and that are rather heavily cited and uh, applied to some extent for planning evaluation in research studies, the Bettenberry model developed within our group in collaboration with research laboratories some years ago, the Karabe model and the McNamara model, we uh, could uh, see the, the following. So let's, let's, let's look here. For a typical uh, late-reacting uh, tissue, as many of the healthy tissues uh, are, characterized by a low alpha-beta ratio of uh, 3 grays, the RB is very close to 1.1, um, unless we go um, very low in dose per fraction when we see a slight increase in the RB 
and the disagreement between the modals. For the same LAT value, an early reacting uh, tissue, as most tumors are, will have an RB very close to 1.1. If we look again at the normal tissue irradiated with uh, protons of higher LAT now, as it would be expected close to the distal edge of the, uh, of the field, the RB might be very different than 1.1, close to 2 at very low doses per fraction. And finally, the worst case, the worst combination with respect to deviations of uh, the RB from the constant 1.1, it's the low reacting tissue uh, or a prostate tumor, for instance, with an alpha beta of 1.1, you know, 1.5 um, uh, gray, irradiated with high LAT uh, protons in a hyperfractionated manner, so with low doses per fraction, which might lead to an RB close to 3. So the most problematic situation is here that corresponds to organs at risk behind the target. So the variable RB models predict increased effectiveness of the protons compared to the fixed 1.1 RBE in low alpha beta tissues irradiated with higher LAT values and lower doses per fraction. What would be the clinical implications of a scenario like that? Well, what are the low uh, alpha over beta tissues? They could be some tumors, like the prostate tumor, which is quite special, and uh, the breast tumors, meaning that higher RB could be expected if they are irradiated with hyperfractionated schedules, so low doses per fractions, many fractions, and high LAT. And this, in principle, is okay, because that would mean more dose to the tumor, to the target. But also, low alpha beta tissues are most of the organs at risk and generally the normal tissue. So higher RB could therefore be expected for them as well if they are located close to the distal edge of the target. And this is not okay at all, as these organs are expected to be located indeed behind the distal edge of the target if one should aim at taking advantage of the Bragg peak and the physical properties of uh, protons to their full potential. And this might therefore lead to unexpected increase uh, of the normal tissue complication probability for the organs we particularly aim uh, at protecting the most if we neglect these uh, variations in RBE. And the fact that um, RB for protons might be different from 1.1 was investigated uh, by, uh, was recognized and then uh, proposed for investigation by a task group of the American Association of Physicists in, in Medicine, AAPM. And the summary of uh, this report was published a few years ago in uh, Medical Physics. The aims of this uh, task group, as explicitly stated in the report, were to assess whether the current clinical practice of using a constant RB for protons should be revised or maintained, um, to identify sites and treatment strategies where variable RB might be utilized for a clinical benefit, assess the potential clinical consequences of uh, delivering biologically weighted um, uh, proton doses based on variable RBE and or LAD models implemented in treatment planning systems. And finally, recommend experiments that are needed to improve uh, the current understanding of the relationship uh, among in vitro, in vivo, and clinical RBE, and the research required to develop models for this variable RBE. One of the findings of this comprehensive study was the fact that based on the model, the use of a constant clinical RB of 1.1, that is independent on the alpha over beta ratio for photons, the fraction size and the effective dose average LAD or a distribution of dose average LAD values within tumors or targets in general and OERs, it's not well justified in terms of our current understanding of the RB for cell survival. So the report was also um, showing that in spite of the large amount of uh, data on the RB for clinically relevant uh, those average LAT values, 
alpha over beta values and doses, the proton RB values are still associated with considerable uncertainties. And the conclusion of the report was that, quoting, the use of RB of 1.1 at 2 gray in the target, it's not entirely unreasonable. This is a very um, particularly chosen formulation, I would say, from uh, the author's uh, side. If RB values should be chosen conservatively, so smaller RB values, to avoid the underdosage of the target. Caution is warranted for small spread out brackets with uh, and or for low alpha beta values where the average RB could be higher. So in other words, what this report is telling us is that the constant 1.1 RB might not be wrong for the target, although some hotspots might be expected, but it could be wrong for the OERs, for the organs at risk, that might receive a larger RB weighted dose than expected. So exactly what we try to prevent. Furthermore, the report is also pointing out that the slope of the dose response curve for the normal tissue complication probability is steeper compared to the slope for um, the tumor control probability, meaning that RB uncertainties are even more critical for the normal tissue complication probability. As for the normal tissue, um, it's expected that the normal tissue will be, will be greatly affected by hotspots uh, if we talk about uh, the brain stem uh, or, or the clinical uh, uh, or, or some other um, uh, parallel organs like the spinal cord or the optic nerves. Um, and, and the RP uncertainty, it's uh, a great concern and for these particular organs. And therefore, different maximum dose constraints might, might, might be needed, might uh, be adopted in the future for these uh, tissues. And this is indeed an important concern since the NTCP calculation, in particular, the difference um, in NTCP that might indicate the gain of treating with protons instead of uh, photons, it's the basis of the selection of the patients for proton therapy at, uh, at the centers that um, uh, embrace the so-called Dutch uh, Delta NTCP model for patient selection for protons. So as the current delta NTCP calculations are based on those limits for the normal tissues calculated, assuming a constant 1.1 RB for protons, th there will be some questions like, for instance, um, how much would the NTCP values differ if the RB is not 1.1, but it's variable? Uh, would this affect the patient selection based on delta NTCP and eventually should those limits for the normal tissues be reconsidered in case of variable RB? So knowing therefore that the RB might be different than 1.1, the question would be, what is the impact of this variable RBE on the comparison between photon and uh, proton plants and how this variation is taken into account when performing an evaluation of the plant robustness, for instance? And furthermore, how should one take into account this variation at the stage of planning and optimizing the plants for protons? So let us start with the planning comparison. I'll present a few examples in which uh, plants were made for protons considering a constant RB of 1.1 and the variable uh, RBE. Uh, and the plants are compared with each other and with an alternative photon plant that was considered as a uh, reference. Here we have a brain um, tumor, a brain um, case with typical OERs like the brain stem, the optic chiasm, and the optic nerve. A proton plant was uh, made considering an RB of 1.1 as in the clinical practice and compare, uh, compared favorably with, uh, with a photon plant as it was uh, showing um, lower uh, doses to, to the OERs in, and generally a sharper uh, gradient of the dose towards the normal uh, brain as expected from a proton plant. And the dose averaged LAT uh, for this uh, plant 
uh, was uh, calculated in a, a, a research version of uh, Ray Station. And uh, the corresponding RBE distribution was also calculated based on this, uh, those uh, average um, LED values, taking into account uh, the tissues of interest, the type of the tissues, so the alpha over beta there, and the actual uh, doses per fraction uh, to be delivered. And one could thus observe here higher RBE values behind the target. Now, if we look at the difference in um, equivalent dose between the proton and um, uh, the photon plan in the two cases, uh, one could observe that uh, for the constant RBE, the comparison would be in favor of the proton plan, as we expected, as the RBE weighted dose in the normal tissue appears to be uh, lower in the uh, proton plan than in the photon plan. While in the case of the variable RBE, the plan comparison is not necessarily um, uh, in, uh, in favor of, uh, of uh, the protons with, with a slightly uh, lower dose in, in the target and a higher dose at the distal edge. And um, a similar situation was observed in two more cases of uh, brain tumors um, that were considered here in which the targets um, had um, different locations. So elevated LAT values uh, behind the target or close to the target or within the OERs, which together with, uh, with the dose per fraction and the type of tissue resulted, of course, in larger RB values than 1.1 in these particularly sensitive OERs that were aimed to be protected. Now, looking again at the difference in uh, equivalent dose between the proton and the photon plan indicated a bias um, in favor of the proton plan if the var variability of, um, of, uh, of um, uh, the RB with LAT and the type of tissue would not be considered with a constant 1.1 value. So let us continue with a new example and see, uh, look at some sub-targets outside uh, the brain. Let us say that we, we do the same. Uh, we have a patient who could be a good choice for proton therapy, and we make a proton plan under the assumption of a constant 1.1 RBE, which is uh, as good as uh, the best photon plan in terms of target uh, dose and even better at sparing the organs at risk. And we assess that by comparing the normal tissue complication probability for the organs at risk. If we take now into account the variable RBE, um, would the proton plan still be better than uh, the photon plan? So here we considered, as I said, some, some other type of, of uh, target than brain target, so a prostate cancer patient, for which um, a photon and a proton uh, plan with 1.1 RB were initially uh, made. We consider a prostate uh, case, knowing that um, prostate uh, tumors could have a low alpha over beta values, and uh, it could be as low as 1.5 uh, gray. And therefore, one might expect deviations of the RBE from the constant 1.1 value, as predicted by um, the models based on uh, in vitro cell survival. To investigate now the influence of the dose per fraction on the RBE and consequently uh, the comparison of, of the plans, we consider three fractionation schedules for prostate that are equivalent from the point of view of their effectiveness on the normal tissue, so the BD on the normal tissue. A conventionally fractionated schedule implying uh, a total of uh, 78 grays delivered in 30 fractions of two grays per fraction, a hypofractionated treatment delivering 42.8 grays in seven fractions, so uh, 6.11 grays per fraction, and something in between um, 70, um, um, 57.2 uh, grays in 15 fractions. 
So here we have uh, the VMAT plan and the original 1.1 RB plan for 78 grace in 39 fractions of the grace. And uh, starting from, from this uh, uh, plan and the, the, the uh, LED values in each voxels of the proton plans were calculated and the corresponding RB values using three different models for the RB, uh, the three different models that were previously presented, taking also into account the actual dose per fraction in each voxel and the alpha over beta, uh, depending on the tissue, were also calculated. So the new dose distributions are then calculated and the plans are compared based on these new dose distributions together with the DVHs and the calculated NTCP for uh, the rectum as one uh, of the critical organs to drift here. So here we have the original photon plan, the original proton plan, together with the new dose distributions for uh, the RB calculated with one of the models, the Baden-Berry model, assuming an alpha over beta for the prostate uh, PTV of uh, 1.5 gray, and an alpha beta of 3 grays for all the OERs and also the normal tissue. The fourth plan here corresponds to uh, the same model but given, the, given uh, the fact that there is some uncertainty in the alpha over beta for prostate, an upper limit for the alpha beta range was considered. So an alpha over beta of five grays for the PTV was considered when evaluating the RB. So one could observe that uh, there is a ring of high doses at the edge of uh, the PTV, but inside the PTV for the plan assuming an alpha over beta of 1.5 gray, due to the fact that the models predict high RB. RB for low alpha over beta tissues, and the spill out of the high dose outside the PTV for the case of alpha over beta of 5 grays. In both cases, some higher dose to the rectum is also observed. The comparison of the plants in terms of DVHs, it's also shown here for all three uh, schedules. And doses to the OERs are rather small, so the plants are generally very good. But doses to the PTV could be either larger than the original ones for the conventional fractionated uh, scheme or lower for the hypofractionated scheme. Now, in order to see if, uh, if the small differences in the dose to the rectum are clinically important, we also calculated the normal tissue complication probability for uh, two endpoints. It is quite interesting to notice that while the NTCP values for the photon and the proton plan calculated with 1.1 with, uh, RB were similar for a uh, grade larger than one toxicity for the rectum, the models predict considerably higher complications apart from one of the cases. So the variable RBE versus the constant 1.1 RB plan comparison showed that the dose to the target might be higher, but also more heterogeneous, and the NTCP is generally higher, and the largest difference is observed for the conventional fractionation. Being aware now of this problem, the question is what to do. What to do in terms of making better plans to avoid this situation with the tools that are already available? One idea is to reoptimize the plan by taking now into account the variable RB in order to obtain a homogeneous dose to the target that is close to what was considered to be acceptable in the original plan under the same constraints for the organs at risk. So what we did in this particular study was the following. We divided the target in sub-targets, depending on the LAT distribution and the RB values, and we re-optimized the plan using a new physical pr prescribed dose that was derived from the RBE calculations. And an IMPT plan was therefore made and the LAT distribution was kept rather similar. And the results, um, the result of this reoptimization was a plan that was more homogeneous in terms of RBE weighted dose. And here are the results. This is how the plan was looking like, showing that it is feasible to re-optimize and avoid this potential toxicity because of the variable RBE in the organs at risk and the loss of, uh, of uh, uh, control of the target. 
the interesting thing was that the NPCP after re-optimizing the plan was even lower than in the original plans. So there is a gain of, of performing a re-optimization in this way. Now, the results um, shown so far uh, indicated that the RB models might render different results, in fact. So in addition, uh, one has to keep in mind that there are uncertainties not only regarding the choice of the model, but also regarding the parameters of, uh, of the model. So with so many uncertainties to take into account, are these plans calculated in this way robust? What does robustness mean in this in this context? Well, a plan it's it's then considered to be robust if um, the dose agreement between the nominal scenario, so the one with no errors, and the appropriate error scenarios satisfy the dosimetric requirements for the clinical target volume, so the CTV, and the OERs. The nominal scenario here that is used for the comparison it's the plan optimized for a 1.1 RBE. But of course, one could wonder if the RB 1.1, it's a scenario uh, that it's uh, error free. And of course, it's, it's not. There are always um, uh, errors. So any plan is prone to errors because of the uncertainties in the physical proton dose related to the setup and of course, the range of the protons. In order then to investigate what is the impact of the variable RB on the robustness of the plans, we performed the following study. We divided the analysis in, in two parts. In the first part, we looked at the uncertainties in the physical proton dose, in particular at setup and range uncertainties. And we calculated uh, the doses for many scenarios corresponding to different combinations between range and setup uncertainties that could actually be encountered in the clinical uh, practice. We calculated the doses per voxel. And we looked at the lower and upper boundaries for the physical doses per voxel and determined the worst case scenario with respect to the physical dose related to range and setup uncertainties. This dose distribution was used then as input in the second part of the analysis, in which we looked at the uncertainties in RBE, so the radiobiological uncertainties, sort of saying. Probability distribution functions were assumed for the alpha over beta ratios and for the LAT and the parameters of the RB were therefore generated in each voxel and calculated distributions of uh, RB values uh, per voxels were created. We did not look in this case only to prostate patients cases, but we also looked at some breast cases and head and neck cases. And two RB models were also uh, considered, the uh, Bedenberg and the McNamara models. And here, we have some uh, examples to illustrate this impact on the variable RBE on the calculation of, uh, of uh, the potential um, uh, dose uh, weighted, uh, RB weighted uh, doses to show that it's feasible to perform this calculation. Now, uh, more results in, in quantitative terms are uh, shown here for different uh, types of tumors and three fractionation schedules um, in, each, uh, in each case. So for the uh, plants assuming a 1.1 RBE, the DVH bands uh, were shown to, to depend on the fractionation schedule and the sensitivity to random setup errors was shown to increase with decreasing the number of fractions as expected. For the variable plans, it was also shown that the DPH uh, bands depend on the fractionation schedule and the type of the tissue, as we know that the RB increases with increasing the dose per fraction, and therefore RB is less dependent on the alpha over beta ratio for higher fractionation doses. The nominal values and the ranges of uh, normal tissue complication probabilities for different organ set risk and for different fractionations and endpoints are shown here. And one could see that uh, the ranges of values could be rather large for some cases, and the actual values could also be rather large, as in this example, for instance, for, for the parted uh, glands. 
So neglecting the variable RB and its uncertainties might lead to underestimations of the variation of the RB weighted doses to the clinical target volume and the organs at risk. Now, what could be the clinical consequences of these differences? So far, we just looked and made some assumptions for some uh, potential uh, cases. But is there actual a clinical consequence that it's, it's observed? Well, this is definitely not an easy answer because it includes many variables and also many confounding factors. But let us look together at some examples. I have here three cases. Three cases of patients that were treated at the Scandium clinic uh, and that experienced unforeseen effects following the treatment. These effects are not iatrogenic, so we are not talking here about malpraxis or, or mistakes or anything of this kind, as the treatment plans and the delivery of the treatment plans were conformal to the protocol, assuming an RB of 1.1, as it's the general consensus that it's used everywhere around the world, and the clinical assessment was performed by the whole clinical team and the plans were deemed to be good. So, one patient was treated for a benign lesion uh, and developed uh, a paralysis of, on half of the body, and the other two uh, developed unilateral blindness. So here are three cases of, of patients out of 1,600 treated at, at Stanion. So statistically, there are very few cases, but there are three patients too many from the clinical point of view. Now, by retrospectively looking at the radiotherapy plans for these patients and evaluating them under the assumption that the relative biological effectiveness for the protons is um, uh, 1.1, well, there was no, no warning sign uh, that something might go uh, wrong. However, by applying a model, uh, assuming that the rel relative biological effectiveness, it's not constant, but variable, together with a model for assessing the probability of normal tissue complication probability leading to brain necrosis and hence paralysis or damage to the optic nerve and hence blindness, we could predict levels of complications in these patients that were one order of magnitude higher compared to the plants that were actually clinically accepted. We therefore worked on, 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 on um, retrospectively, of course, uh, making new treatment plans for these patients to see if it's possible to um, re-optimize the plans, to optimize them with respect to the fluence, so the number of protons and their energy, that would ensure the same coverage of the target, but reduce the effect on the normal tissue and hence decrease the probability of normal tissue complication and the unwanted effects if we would have evaluated the plans from the beginning with a variable RBE and not just uh, a fixed 1.1 uh, uh, RBE. And indeed, uh, performing this optimization, we managed to decrease with one order of magnitude the level of normal tissue complication probability, bringing it basically back to the level that was clinically uh, accepted. Of course, um, this is, these are three examples here, and we are fully aware uh, of the fact that, that from probability to causality, it's a very long way. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we were happy to say that we have the methodology and we also have the tools in place for performing this kind of studies that would allow us to progress towards better proton plans in the future that, that um, would, would, would um, allow us to conduct these future uh, studies uh, if, if eventually it would be confirmed our concern regarding the variable proton RB and its potential clinical implications. So in conclusion, um, based on, on our studies, um, we can say that um, the models and, and the experience so far 
point towards the fact that neglecting the variable RBE and neglecting uh, its uncertainties might lead to an underestimation of the variation of the RBE weighted doses generally to the clinical target volume and OERs, but accounting for this in an optimization or a re-optimization of the physical dose may generate plans with satisfying worst case um, uh, CTB doses and acceptable uh, doses to the organs at risk. To summarize more generally, I would like actually to quote from, from the AAPM report uh, on, on this, uh, on this uh, topic that says the following. The current clinical practice of using a constant RB for protons should generally be maintained, but specific clinical scenarios warrant a change in current practice. What are these specific scenarios? So it is important to acquire clinical data to allow the reconstruction of RB doses and correlate with clinical outcome in both prospective and retrospective studies. There are sites and treatment strategies to be identified where variable RB might be safely utilized for clinical benefit. And the proton therapy community needs to assess the potential clinical consequences of the clinical implementation of variable RB and those weighted uh, LAT models into the TCP. And finally, experiments are needed. We could speculate, uh, but still we need more exper experiments to improve our current understanding of the relationship among in vitro, in vivo and clinical RB. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators and in particular the work of uh, Jacob Oden and Mina Wedenberry on this uh, topic, as well as my other collaborators on this project. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Juliana, for a really inspiring presentation and eye-opening. And I would like to start with some questions, if possible. Can you please tell us how accurate is the modified microdosimetric kinetic model to predict proton RBE? No, I cannot say how accurate is the MK uh, model for, for the proton RBE. I would say that there are advantages of, uh, of using this uh, uh, kind of models uh, based on uh, microdosimetric uh, quantities because they do take into account particularities of the drug structures and they could differentiate between uh, several aspects there um, to better extent than this uh, semi-empirical models that I, I mentioned uh, today, but exactly how accurate would it be? I cannot really say, I would not um, be able to, to give an estimate of, of that, but there are many, uh, um, many, not many, but perhaps um, several attempts really to look a little bit uh, closer into the micro dosimetry. Uh, in relation to this uh, this issue, and there is potential there, definitely. Yes, absolutely. Now you showed us three examples where patients out of over a thousand had extended uh, negative side effects, and you said that it could be potentially due to not taking into account the LET changes and RBE. But we know even from photon therapy that you can have a very different response between two patients being treated with photons uh, being given exactly the same treatment. How do you know that this is not simply the biological variation between the patients? And you know, we know that some people, even in the normal population, cannot repair radiation damage very well. We don't know that. We don't know that. Yeah. These were three patients that presented these rather extreme toxicities that could not be explained strictly based on the plan. And we can, of course, 
um, speculate whether these were these special uh, hypersensitivity patients. We can think about some other uh, reasons that were not identified, or we can consider the variable RB. Yeah, you uh, didn't okay. do like blood sample to look at the, or hair sample to look at their radiation response? No, no, yeah. no. Uh, but uh, in the future, we are actually planning to look at a much larger cohort to see whether these were just some um, uh, uh, accidentally, <laughs> accidentally, uh, you know, coincidences, and then uh, yeah, uh, or uh, indeed there is some proof for for the variable RB. Yeah. Oh, it could be combination of things. Could be a combination of things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what would be the physical processes responsible for the increase in RB observed in the distal region of the break peak? Could it be multi-electronic processes of multiple ionization and transfer ionization? Well, it's the um, um, most straightforward uh, explanation for that. It's the higher density of, uh, of uh, energy deposition events. So the LAD there is higher. And we could simply expect more double strand break or more complex double strand breaks than uh, in the plateau uh, region. There is a bit of a mechanistical explanation because as the charged particles are moving slower, they spend increased time in the vicinity of the atomic or molecular electrons. And therefore the probability for interaction increases and the larger energy transfers are possible. Uh, and therefore you have a higher, a higher LET. Yeah. Now, what parameter would you change for the re-optimization to redistribute the high LET RBE regions? Well, um, here I, I mentioned in fact two, two approaches. Uh, one was this re-optimization that was extremely simplistic. <laughs> Uh, but simplistic for once in, in the good sense of the word, in the sense that it was not overly sophisticated. Um, as we just calculated the RB weighted dose with a variable RBE and tried to um, 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 re-optimize uh, the plan uh, with a threshold lower than this, this dose in the organs at risk. And this is something that can be done already now in any treatment planning system, because that's just the physical dose that you, you yeah. try to, to reduce. Yeah. For the other, um, um, for the other uh, method that I, I mentioned that was used in the optimization of these uh, three patients that we evaluated, uh, track and uh, proton track and uh, optimization was uh, used. Uh, the method it's, uh, was developed by uh, research laboratories and it's uh, published, if I'm not mistaken, in medical physics, no, or in the Red Journal. Uh, and the authors are uh, of this uh, method are um, uh, Jacobo Den and Eric Tranaus. So I would recommend uh, to look at those publications. This, this, uh, publication because it's yeah, it's giving it, it's giving a comprehensive answer. Of course, in any NTCP optimization, we cannot forget the TCP as the primary objective. Uh, so when you re-optimize the plans for those three patients, was there any impact on the TCP? Not so much, no. Um, because for, for this, for this uh, uh, patients, I mean, first of all, it was a typical tumor with an alpha beta of 10. And mm -hmm. There, the RB it's not uh, so so much uh, different from uh, 1.1 what was initially uh, optimized. No. Mm -hmm. And uh, can the LETs and does RB weighted dose be assessed using Monte Carlo based dose engines? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And okay. uh, um, uh, not uh, uh, RB models could could be developed. Uh, uh, based on some other parameters than uh, LAT. In fact, there is ongoing work that I would uh, like to take the opportunity to, to mention during this uh, webinar within our group uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, one of our PhD students, uh, Pedri Kalholm, um, who looks at uh, alternative uh, metrics for the uh, quality of radiation than, uh, than uh, the dose average LAT. 
and this these are determined uh, based on, on Monte Carlo. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the challenges of using higher dose dose per fraction to reduce the RB related uncertainties? Because where you can remember your sort of graphs tend to sort of flatten a bit. Yeah. So with the higher dose per fraction. Yes. So um uh that we have to think now uh, in, in about um, what does this actually mean. So we can uh, prescribe a high dose per fraction in order to get rid of these problems related to the RBE, but that would be for the target. A yeah. plan will inherently, if it's a good plan, result in, in a, a lower dose into the normal tissue. And even if that low dose, uh, if, if that, plan, it, it, it's very good, then it's a low dose, and it could be a very low dose, uh, you know, even if it's a hypofractionated uh, uh, schedule, that combined with a high LAT could lead to a higher RB than expected. Mm -hmm. So um, even if we say that a hypofractionated schedule will uh, help us avoiding the problems with a variable RBE, that will not necessarily be the case in the normal tissue. Exactly. Is research clinical treatment planning system used by Scandian Clinical? This is a uh, uh, research version of research. Uh, Ray Station, yeah. and uh, it's, it's, it's not yet uh, a clinical product. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there should be more development by all manufacturers of treatment planning system to enable us more? biological optimization or at least evaluations of TCP and TCP? Uh, yes, actually, I do believe that. Uh, I, I, uh, I, will, um, I will try to uh, formulate this carefully in the sense that I think uh, the manufacturers uh, of treatment planning systems for protons uh, uh, should actually consider including the possibility to calculate the LAT and some other metrics because this, is, this should not be an issue per se, as uh, many of the, those calculation engines are based on Monte Carlo. So determining the LAT or any other metric per voxel should not be the major challenge. Yeah. And then allow at least the possibility through scripting to calculate the RB values using one model or another or many other models. There are many uncertainties, of course, in the parameters for calculating these RBE uh, values, but we have to learn from the clinical exper experience. We have to be very much aware of, of these cases that might indicate a variable RBE that should have been mitigated at the time of treatment planning. And for that, it will be really good if we will have all of these tools at hand, that we will not have to resource all the time a research version of the treatment planning system yes. uh, for, for making these calculations. I will not say that all of us should start now doing uh, uh, optimization for the variable yes. RD. Far from that, we are not yet there. Mm -hmm. We still need to learn from, from what we see in the clinic, we still need to perform radiobiological experiments with other endpoints than cell survival and so forth. But at least we should be aware of the problem, have our eyes wide open to what is mm -hmm. happening with our patients, follow yes. up the patients, uh, not only for this, this extreme toxicities as I showed in, in, in my, yeah. my case here, but also for radiological changes that potentially could indicate at some point some toxicity learn from this experience and ask the manufacturers to provide us with the tools. Absolutely. Uh, can I maybe tempt you uh, to comment on carbon ions? Where RB is maybe perhaps even more complicated question. This is true. This is true. Uh, but for carbon ions, the issue of RB, it's at least um, recognized mm -hmm. <laughs> at the time of, of, of making, optimizing the yeah. plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is also true that um, a, a plan uh, optimized uh, at one carbon ion center um, or a dose <laughs> calculated at one carbon ion center, it's not 
because okay. the same goes at another carbon ion center. Yeah. But I, I think uh, the particle therapy community is rather well aware of that. And the extrapolation of the doses and, and um, yeah, it's, it's not done blindly from one center to another. The clinical experience, it's not transferred blindly from one center yeah. to, to, to another. Yeah. Dear Juliana, thank you very much. I have to stop the discussion at this point and uh, thank you for really opening our eyes to the complexities of the proton therapy and treatment planning systems and looks like that there are many opportunities for medical physicists to improve the radiotherapy to patients. And uh, uh, Madame, can I please introduce our next speaker for the next session? Thank you. Please carry on. Yeah. Okay. So I will now share the screen. Uh, while I would like to thank all the participants who have spent one or more lecture with us during this fantastic International Medical Physics Week, our program for our members does not finish with today's presentation. And our next seminar will be delivered on 21st of June at 12 p.m. GNT. And it's titled Fractionated Radiotherapy and its Synergistic Relationship with Immunotherapy. And it will be delivered by wonderful Rebecca Delanzo from the University of Western Australia. Thank you very much. Madame, can I hand over to you to uh, close the series during IMPW? Thank you, Eva, for this uh, wonderful moderation and to the speaker, Eliana, for great talk, very meaningful, and uh, to all the participants for their participation. And uh, this is the closure of our IMPW, as far as we are concerned. But celebrations in different countries during the daytime may be happening in many countries. I think with that, uh, I will also like to thank Magdalena for doing a wonderful job of technical support for this. And uh, if there is anything to be added by John, I will ask him to add now. No, it's, it's okay. Uh, I would like to thank all colleagues for participating in uh, all webinars. Um, from Monday to today, <laughs> today's webinars, uh, very nice uh, event. I would like to thank you all and see you. Okay. All next the time. best. Bye bye. Thank bye you. bye. Bye. Thank you. bye.